D20 questions. Flatter the size of an acorn's. We're going live. Oh, hello, everyone. Hello, all you cuties and other people who are here for some reason. Thank you so much for choosing <laughs> to do that exact thing. Yeah, I don't. I can't imagine why you would, but here we are. Well, uh, we've never done this show as a stream before, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're playing with a lot of new ideas and stuff, but the, the, the bread and butter is that we're going to do a little interview. So I need to welcome you to D20 Questions, the show that puts the bleh in tabletop role playing. Um, my name is Law, the six foot garden gnome that lives in a psychedelic mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Zach, uh, the, the, the insufferable Riddler who can think of a simple riddle for himself. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I actually uh, forgot that there's no intro. I forgot we do intro goofs. Oh, <laughs> completely no. spaced it. Well, either way, I would like to thank our special guest, Travis Vengroff. And Travis, would you like to introduce yourself and let the folks at know the folks at home know who you is and what you diz? <laughs> sure. I, I'm Travis. I make sounds for a living uh, for shows like Dark Dice, The White Vault, Fast Horizon, and Liberty. And that's mm. that's my job. Awesome. Hell yes. Man of the Perfect. hour. You're getting a lot of, a lot of very good press lately. Um, and I yeah, couldn't, couldn't be happier for you. I, uh, we are looking at all the chat. Thank you guys for showing up and being interactive. Just so you all know, um, we're going to do some Q and a at the end of the stream. So stick around and we'll answer, we'll, we'll ask your questions. We'll pass them on to Travis. Um, so a lot of interview shows, when they introduce a new guest, they like to be like, do you have any shout outs or people you want to thank? We're, we like to flip the script on that. Do you have anyone you'd like to throw a very firm fuck you at? Like just someone you really want to get it <laughs> off your chest. You know, I was, I, when you say like, I was like, oh wait, you're the show that I normally recommend. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's well, see. I, I, I don't know. I, I'll get really angry. Um, very good wow, you are not going to fit in here. <laughs> I, I, I normally get fictionally angry, but, but actually angry. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. I'm sure I will somewhere like at the end of this. But well, for now, I'll just say what I like to go for is somebody from high school yeah. or like a teacher that like never really gave, never really did you right. You know, like that's those are the real fuck yous. Those are the ones that really matter. If you want to yeah, hit us with yeah. a surprise fuck you in the middle of the stream, I am 100 percent for it. Go oh, yeah, at any moment, you can feel free to tell us to go fuck ourselves. So, not you guys, not you guys. Oh, okay, fair. I, I like you, both of you. Um, Yay! I have to think on this one, though. Someone I actually don't like. This no, sli yeah, slip go. it in subtly. This, we'll see if we can tell who you're talking about when the time comes. <laughs> um, My high another, school bully or something. Yeah, you'll yeah. be like, I'm fuck Pitbull, too. You're like, all right. <laughs> Mr. Worldwide, why? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> are you so nice. Uh, More like Mr. Wideload. Get out of my fucking face with your crappy music. Nice. Uh, another question that I feel is very important to get to know someone and really kind of like unfold the mysteries of their, their I guess, appendix. I don't know. Um, right. What is your persona? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have an appendix anymore. I meant, I, meant, I meant in a book, but I love it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh. oh. Uh, my, my, my persona or fir fursona? Your fursona. Fir Neither of us are first, but we love to ask people what their fursonas are. Yeah. No, I, 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 I haven't figured that out yet. I don't know. What animal speaks Maybe you can, to you? Is it a raunchy armadillo? <laughs> no, that's, a, that's, that's another really good question. Uh, mm -hmm. What animal speaks to me? Unicorns speak to me uh, in my dreams. Okay. Good. Uh, good. That's, is there that's a, a good term start. For, for horse furry? I think they're still furries, right? Are they like hoofies? I mean, hoofy? I was literally like, <laughs> you beat me to it with hoofy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think hoofy counts. And I, of course, unicorns are in the same genus as a horse. So um, I want to be. be something cool, like like a tiger or a lion, but I know I'm just like like a badger. <laughs> like yeah, I'm You just go on the Chinese zodiac and you get a pig or a monkey. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, the last I question like I want to ask you is to get to know your take on things is, do you think birthday cake counts as its own flavor? Uh, if the flavor is chocolate. <laughs> but yeah. like, can you, can you have a birthday <laughs> cake flavored something? Cause that's, yeah. see, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the problem because <laughs> mm -hmm. birthday cake is a, has flavors. And how can something be a flavor if it has its own distinct flavors? Right. Like, it, it, oh man, I, I would say, I would say no. No then, because my, my wife has a very different opinion of birthday cake. And when exactly. it's her birthday, I do not enjoy the cake as much as when it's mine. 
I will say, however, that like lately I've been noticing this trend in American diners where like pancakes aren't being made with like a good solid pancake batter. They're being made with like a sweet cream batter that tastes like like generic birthday cake flavoring. Mm-hmm. And it's pissing me off to no end because that flavor inherently reminds me of the the birth cake flavor birth that cake. I hate so much. <laughs> I love birth a good cake. birthday cake. It's, it's a descriptor that I, I admire and respect. Birth cake, birthday cake flavor is a flavor, yeah. but it's it's also not a flavor in the sense that yeah, all birth, yes. you know, birthday cake is not its thing, but it is a flavor descriptor. If you see a that's product like, that's, oh, that's labeled, soda flavor. Yeah. If you see yeah. a product that's labeled yeah. as birthday cake flavor, what it is, is it's a white sheet cake with sprinkles and neither of those are a flavor. Yeah. <laughs> this is also they're both, they're both really the, the canvas on which you paint flavor, but we'll get into some real questions here now that we've, we've like we're in Assassin's Creed here. Everything is true. <laughs> so, why don't you just, well, I think this will be a good one to start. Like, why don't you walk us through what it's, what it feels like in a typical recording session for, for one of your shows and how they've changed since you started from, from now to then. Okay. A typical recording session for dark dice. Uh, it's, it's 2 AM Pacific time. I'm, I'm crying <laughs> because my cast is, has been awake for a few hours in Europe and the East coast people are just starting to wake up and it's time for us to play a game and I can't be too loud because my wife is one room over, <laughs> but I'm going to host a D&D game at 2 a.m. Uh, so we, we record for about six hours, mm-hmm. and then uh, that's usually pretty brutal and fun. Um, we've got bathroom breaks in the middle, and uh, I, I tell them that they'll hear the audio eventually in about a year or two, and it'll be so much better than they remembered it, and they're, <laughs> they're, uh, that, that I remembered it being at 2 a.m., uh, and, and it'll be fantastic. Um, we record in these really big hour uh, six hour chunks so we can get like most of the season done and they remember the plot because we did our first story which was um liberty vigilance which is my first ttrpg recorded adventure and we did like two hour chunks and i found that the players would forget the plot because we would only play every two or three months um mm. they forget a lot of stuff and right as we get into the groove like the session be over like okay two yeah. hours is down or three hours it's is a down. good reason to make so, your cast listen to the show though just so they can remember what actually happened <laughs> and see like we're the exact opposite like by the time we're done by the time we're on our fourth episode everybody's tired everybody wants to go home nobody wants to be here but i'll be honest we've actually never recorded a single episode we just kind of like sit around and all of a sudden episodes will show up none of us <laughs> remembering ever spoken into a microphone but we're taking the fame we'll have it in the chat mistress dana who's uh, one of our players in season two uh, was very jealous of the fact that your players get breaks. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have ADHD, and I only recently discovered this and diagnosed it. So I, I have a tough time paying attention for long periods of time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that, that's helpful for me too as a DM. It's like, oh, they went left. They're supposed to go right. Oh my god, how oh, can I make no, this No, they've gone off the gridded sheet. <laughs> Adventurers yeah. went left. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I have to write up new descriptions. I usually have about like. A, pages of descriptions just like in the, in the can like ready to go like oh you found the tree of woe and i'll describe the tree of woe and it's and a literal utter. can like with pieces of paper sticking out of the top <laughs> <laughs> my handwriting is terrible too with and the the, the whatever was in the can before is has gotten color on it mm. <laughs> coffee stained game notes exactly uh, how, how much time is there between the period when you record and when your episodes come live to the public like what would you estimate we finished the whole first season in two sessions or uh, four sessions. It was four days. It was two weekends. Um, it was like six, 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 and one more six just to round things out. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, I know I, I, I tried to kill them at the third six, but I failed. A few of them survived. Respect. Um, but then uh, that was that was in 2018, 2017. And then chapter 16 just came out this year. So a couple years. Um, but we've recorded a lot since then. And I've got like two or three seasons of content that I've just got to kind of chug through um, now to get to, to current. Cause like people are like, we want to be in your show. And I'm like, you didn't back then. Of course. Sorry. Right? <laughs> where were you then when I knew where was, <laughs> are you? where was gone? Like <laughs> <laughs> where was gone? Where when the West West fell? Fell. I'd like to say that while you were, while you were giving that very lovely description of how it works, Zach imbibed eight different fluids all in succession. <laughs> Half of was one of snot. those eye drops? Did you get that no, thirsty? One of them is medication, and I'm not going to go into the details on that. Oh, but uh, <laughs> you're getting fucked up on Visine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are all drinking adult beverages, just so the viewers at home know. Uh, I am currently drinking one of our traditional D20 question beverages, a Stegila, which is tequila with grapefruit Stegel. 
<laughs> yes, I'm doing the same. You like honestly, if you've listened to any of our our actual G20 questions podcasts, you will know this is like this is the unofficial drink of the show. This is the unofficial drink of summertime sweaty recording. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Oh, my life Come is on, on. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Logger Road Logger from oh, uh, Distinctly clever. Maine. Yeah, from backpack to the front porch and everywhere in between. Nice. With the same silhouette of tree marketing that you see on the calves of many frat boys. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> People normally selling this brew have the same tattoo. So uh, it seems like, obviously, we all work with sound stuff, but for your show in particular, Dark Dice, kind of the, the flagship, um, it seems like music is a really huge component in making the show. Oh yeah. So wow. what's your Such history? What's your history with music and how do you approach making it match the theme of the show, like directing and creating? So I was a musician for 10 years, quasi professionally thinking about quitting my job and, and going off with my band to do that while I played accordion in a rock band that played video game covers. What was the Perfect. name of the band? We cannot go forward until we know. <laughs> Random encounter. That's the name okay. of our first episode. Okay. That's great. Yeah. That really yeah. Is. <laughs> Awesome. Did you have is, other is, band names that were in the running? Were there other ones that you were like, oh God, I really want to do this, but. I, I had a second band that I also did on the side called Careless Juja. It was uh, pretty, it's that one's, we still make music with that one, um, what but is it's, it's an internet band. Uh, Juja is the guitarist and my nickname was Careless because I was playing accordion, but I would like crowd surf and stuff and I usually oh. fell. So they made fun of me and called me careless. Nice. Like that's what meant, that's a cool nickname. Like, oh careless. Is you just short for something? Because that's a pretty kick ass name. <laughs> no, it's just the nickname he chose. Um, okay. He's, he's, he, he goes by many names. Gary Horses, Palmea, uh, Juja. Um, he's the voice oh. actor in almost all of the shows we make. He's the the sword voice of the sword. He does he impersonate mm. literally any character from from The Simpsons or Futurama. So I will say that actually does bring me to an important question. What is your favorite voice to do? Whether that's like your go-to voice, the one that's very comfortable and easy for you or one that you're most proud of. Oh, and they, and they all get replaced. Cause I don't, I don't have my voices in the show. Um, ah, I think okay. the one I, I was, I enjoyed doing the most, um, when I was, when I was playing, uh, the sword was pretty fun. He was, he was pretty messed up. Uh, it's one that doesn't come out yet. Um, we, we ran, uh, but it's, a, it's a common, like thing that's come out wild sheep chase and I got to play the sheep. Nice. <laughs> I love the sheep because <laughs> he's this really, he's this pompous effing elven wizard stuck mm -hmm. in the body of a sheep. And he's just like, avenge me, my friends. And he's just like, you can almost envision the pig from uh, disenchantment. Oh like, yeah. In, in Matt Berry. Oh, yeah. It's with doc uh, Brown or something is law has been okay. doing a perfect Matt Berry impression uh, for our character page state a row for season two. And I, I am so pleased. Like originally I had intended to do the voice for this character and I had like this whole character planned in my head. And then law was like, what if he was just Matt Berry? And I'm like, Oh no, that's too good. There goes the whole character. Enjoy. <laughs> We'd both been rewatching Garth Marenghi's dark place. And he was just, he was just on our mind. You know, he was, uh, he's mm -hmm. there and he was the perfect character voice for a robot man. Uh, <laughs> Anybody out there who hasn't seen Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, do yourself a favor. It's six episodes in total, and you can find the whole thing on YouTube. It is a, is a precious gift. It is, indeed. I remember you telling me about the goat wizard <laughs> in, in Twitter yeah. chat at some point. Uh, I was very excited to hear that character come to life. Uh, yeah, my favorite, uh, so I was my answering... Voice to, oh, God, sorry. Nope. Yeah, it's your favorite voice. I want to hear this. Which no, my favorite voice to do is the one that everybody already knows now. Like I developed Stormclad Thunder Tongue as a, mm -hmm. like as an accident of doing luck, and now I love that voice so much that it's like my it accidentally ends up being my go to anytime I'm trying to do a southern accent. And now mm -hmm. people at the table are like, Zach, that kind of sounds a little bit like Storm, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I can't do anything in a high register that's not falsetto without people being like, are you doing Kip? It's like, no, yeah, yeah. this sounds very different than Kip, but thank you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like inevitably once you've done that, like once, once people have found like your range, anything on the extremes of your range will sound exactly the same. And I'm like, well, okay, that's just my life now. <laughs> Okay. Well, but no, so my favorite, my favorite moment actually was when I was uh, doing a uh, voice coaching thing because I've been, I have a throat problem and the doctor like told me to like go to my lower register. And so I did storm <laughs> and she's like, I did not believe that that was you doing that voice. I thought somebody was nearby <laughs> and took the microphone and did it for you. And I was so pleased with myself. I was yeah. like, ah. It's funny how many of our fans uh, didn't realize when we first did a character named Reginald 419, who's a robot, that there's not a modulator. I'm just doing a robot voice. <laughs> just give, give me give me a little bit of Reggie right now. Hello, my name is Reginald 419. 
and I, <laughs> and I am a robot. It's so beautiful. I love it. So I didn't know there wasn't a modulator. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome to the fold. Um, what's something in the world of podcasting and sound design that if you could go back in time and tell yourself before you started this road that you were on, what would that, what would that advice be? Ooh, that's tough. That's tough. Um, man, your stuff sucks. You should, you're going to be better in like three years, four years. <laughs> that's what I'd probably tell myself. Um, but, but realistically, uh, do, 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 that's, that's a very good question. Um, Honestly, I feel like fail faster is like a really good piece of advice. Just telling people, get out there and make the mistake. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so good. I, I, I think that's really the answer is just like, keep doing this and don't stop doing this. And, and maybe spend more time on this and less time doing other things. So just keep recording more and, and, oh. and don't stop recording. It's such a tedious aphorism that gets thrown around a lot, but Jake the dog saying sucking at something is the first step to getting kind of good at something is so meaningful and powerful. And it's just such a, it's such a glib thing to say, but it's absolutely true. Just suck at it for a while and trust me, it will be better. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, go back in time and just promise yourself, like, I promise you'll be good. Just give it time. <laughs> like, <laughs> you'll ignore the first, it's Absolutely. like they say with like drawing, like after your first thousand pages, you might start being okay. Like it's, it's you got to throw it away. You got to fill the dumpster before you can climb that trash heap to the mountain. <laughs> I think if I could go back in time and tell myself something, it would be Zach, don't start your own season. Let law be the workhorse forever. Uh, <laughs> you'll be, you'll be so much happier a person watching him work. <laughs> Uh, mine would be, uh, food does not equal emotion. <laughs> ah, mm. that good one's one. good for me too. <laughs> I'll make sure to pop by your house on my way back in time to tell my past self that, <laughs> um, well, let's say in, in so many terms that horror is a pretty big factor of your creative process. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much on brand with what you do. Um, mm -hmm. spook and horror. So what, what are some of your biggest like inspirations, your muses in the world of horror that really gets your juices juicy? Uh, a couple things. Uh, if you're going into like media, there's like some easy callbacks like, Oh, dead space is pretty creepy. Resident Evil three was pretty creepy with its open environment before they did the remake. Um, the remake was good too, but different, different, but good. <laughs> um, you got like, uh, out of the video game world, you get like some really creepy movies you can think through. Um, I'm trying to think of some recently. Uh, mm -hmm. More, the very recently was uh, the uh, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's like the Ritual. It's the one where they're the guys decide to go hiking, but it wasn't such a good idea. Ooh. Zach such is the resident horror idea. expert. I am. I while I appreciate it, I just never I end up consuming any. Believe me, man, oh, like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Ritual caught me completely off guard. I was just like cruising <laughs> through Netflix. I saw it. I'm like, whatever, I'll pop this on. And I was so engrossed from the first seconds. I'm like, all right, this is the movie for me right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're Honestly, in this, though, like, I feel like one thing that you you don't get enough uh, appreciation for is video games as horror inspiration, especially mm -hmm. in D&D. Because one thing that I've noticed a lot is that people don't know how to translate D&D or any other kind of like tabletop environment into a horror genre without the system doing the job for them. Like you're playing Gumshoe, you're playing Trail of Cthulhu, you're playing whatever. And so the system kind of carries the weight for you. It does, the, it does the heavy lifting of giving you a horror genre. What would you say is is your biggest trick to running a non-horror system as a horror experience uh i just wanted to jump back and have one more or two more things real mm. quick on on things and then i'll answer your All question the things the no time. sleep podcast has been incredibly instrumental in like my my way of thinking mm -hmm. uh it, it's i've listened to many, many seasons of it and i've loved it but like they I have a new story years. every got three hours of content every week they put out it's ridiculous and they're all they're, they're all good stories. They're well-produced and put together. I mean, I may not love every story as much as I love most of the stories, but almost every time it's, it's a, every time it's a well-produced story. And, and usually there's a hook to it that someone finds scary or someone found scary. Mm. So I think that's been really helpful in exploring the many shades and colors of horror. And I, if it was with me five years ago before I'd found podcasts or six years ago before I found podcasts or seven, seven, geez, I'm getting older. <laughs> I'd said, I'd have like attributed like, oh, I went to this 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 uh, blockbuster is going out of business, so I purchased their entire horror department, two hundred movies for two hundred dollars. Wow! I watched them all in a summer. Naming a I'm blockbuster like, that, was... that went out of business doesn't narrow it down that much, but yes, I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. But, uh, the other thing is, I draw on a lot of actual horror and, and things that scare me and, and my players with their permission. Sometimes, well, not every time really, but I 
I ask if I can use certain things, and they're like, yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, making the horror system work is really a lot of descriptive text, right? So mm -hmm. writing, sp spending the time ahead of time to write all the descriptions out. Uh, before we ran Domain of the Nameless God, which is the adventure uh, our first season takes place, awesome. uh, I'd written down the descriptions for every monster throughout the entire thing, mm -hmm. well, for half of it, because I thought they'd die. Um, I didn't expect them to reach Roaming Forest, uh, frankly. So I had all the things that the actual character, player, char players of the characters feared. I had the th things that the characters themselves feared, and I turned them into a campaign, mm -hmm. and and things that I feared. But I d had really visceral and disgusting descriptions, so I would never name drop a monster or a creature, mm. and I would hint at things that were going to happen. And I, in the backstories of the characters, normally have skyhooks to work together, and I made ones that clashed intentionally to create party that would not like each other or like they'd be afraid of each other or they'd be distrusting and then of course there's the doppelganger with them the silent one who's infiltrated their mist and who's trying to like act like he's one of them like yeah i'm with the party <laughs> i'm it's one true. of you guys if, if you can get a player to Sleep. be spooked out it's going to be really hard to role play that their character is not also very spooked out <laughs> yeah it was, it was really fun and they're all uh, most of them were, were horror actors because they've been on the white vault it was the cast of the white vault basically sure. Um, some of them were no sleep actors. Um, so the idea of just uh, writing really cool descriptions that are like actually creepy in different ways and exploring what horror can be in more than just sight, you know, mm -hmm. sound, sense, smell, senses that are like divine sense, magic sense, those can be really terrifying if, if you approach those the right way if you have divinely inclined characters. Um, mm. So like descriptions and, and, and that's, that's super helpful and, and keeping kind of a tone of, of seriousness and the idea direness of, of as, as things go on. Making someone afraid of using one of their class features because the way you make it come to life is terrifying. Like detect evil, like describe what they feel. It's like, no, no, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's, it's uncomfortable for, for some of that. And then also like making them empathize when they're fighting actual people, like our, our new episode is kind of the first time in the series that they're like fighting sentient intelligent beings that have emotions and I wanted to make them feel really bad about fighting them. <laughs> Honestly, like, so, so one thing I was trying to apologize to law for and really the, the, the luck community as a whole is that I tend to gear pretty heavily towards the dark and the horror focused and season two of luck is definitely bringing a note, a strong note of that. Like episode four is a, it definitely feels on that, that like horror spectrum. And for mm -hmm. me, one thing that's important is that empathy, being able to like tie a connection to how you feel and how the character feels. And for me, I feel like. Honestly, the best thing I can do in a horror is give somebody a victim to see. Whether whether it's the aftermath or somebody who's currently going through something, hearing the real emotional context for what's happening to a person is important. And now, ideally, you'd want that to be your player, but unfortunately, most players don't think to, like, give emotional and horror context to their experience. Mm -hmm. And that can be really challenging, like, coaxing that out of players. Well, speaking of horror, one of the segments we have here on D20 Questions is known as the history check. Ah, yes. So I'm going to take us down a little little road through the past of tabletop role playing with a little tale. Take us down that road of a company called Judges Guild. They are a practically prehistoric gaming publisher because they've been around since 1976, and they're known for creating settings and role playing supplements, most notably for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, they're considered by many to have made the first tabletop role-playing supplement with a fully fleshed out and developed city environment with their uh, most notable product of the time known as city state of the invincible overlord. Now more on topic, they're also considered by many to have made the, one of the first dungeon crawl supplements that was specifically designed to be horror themed with uh, the Teagle Manor, which came out in 1977. And while the design is very much horror, it's also considered to be fairly like a fun house style dungeon with a pretty strong degree of whimsy and an almost like episodic sprawling series of over 240 unconnected rooms with random encounter charts, taking the party through the cursed home of a family <laughs> tragically named rump. <laughs> um, and while it's compared to modern classics, it can kind of come off as really silly. Uh, it's kind of unpolished narratively. It does have some examples of, genuinely the most beautiful maps um, that I've ever seen in that era 
of tabletop role playing games. Um, in fact, in the 1970s, when they were producing them, Judges Guild could not find printers to regularly produce content that would print the quality of maps that they were drawing. So that was one of the earliest <laughs> hurdles that they had to face. So if you get a chance to look up some of the hand-drawn maps from Teagle Manor, it's some of the most impressive D&D architecture I think you'll find. And it was also the first introduction of horror into what we consider D&D. Nice. Was that the one that had um, like a time traveling room or something? Maybe I'm there's probably 200 rooms. I surely have a time travel room. Yeah, a lot of them weren't connected. It would go everywhere from you encountering some giant beetles to you encountering an old man who was actually like a demon fiend from the third circle of hell or something. To be fair, what self-respecting nobility wouldn't have a time travel room? Yeah, I mean, if you can save up for it, you know, put it in the foyer. If you can get a jacuzzi, <laughs> you can afford a time travel room. In the foyer? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like enter house, house, now I'm in the ni- in 1960s? <laughs> Look, if, you're, if your mansion exists in multiple eras of time, it's just going to feel roomier. It's going to be bigger on the inside. <laughs> this is true. This is very true. Ha. Huh. Well, um, we've been going for about 37 minutes. I think we might take ourselves a quick little break. Um, we're going to play some commercials from the LUQ. And when we come back, we'll have some more questions for Travis about dark dice and everything that he's been working on lately. So we will see you all very shortly. Mother, bubble, brew a double, water boil and strain a tub full. Classic roast of nut and oak. Grind the beans and let them soak. Mocha drip or macchiato, dash of cream or black ristretto, origin of fairest trade, by the ounce and pound be weighed, smoky herb of bitter plum, by the cup full this brew comes. Start your morning ritual with Baba Java and the caffeine coven. Now that's black magic. It's the League of Ultimate Quest Game! It's late at night, and you're all alone. Do you need a support companion? Has the music of your heart gone mute? Call 1-900-SEX-BAR. Sex bar. Our tantalizing troubadours and mesmerizing minstrels will give your love life inspiration. Sex bar. We'll serenade you, read you poetry, and roll seduction check after seduction check. Sex bar. All our bards are just like their charisma scores. 18 and over. Sex bard. 1-900-SEX-BARD. We'll hit on literally anyone. Sex bard. It's the League of Ultimate Questing. Find out more at slapdashstudios.com. Welcome back. Yes, we do indeed get breaks. We allow it. <laughs> if you're just joining us, we're here with Travis Vengroff from Dark Dice, Fool and Scholar Productions, uh, creator of many great podcasts. You've got to check them out. And if you've listened to Dark Dice and haven't given White Vault to listen to, you definitely should give that one. Absolutely. And honestly, if you're if you're here, you're probably from Dark Dice originally. Let's be let's be honest. Yes. Um, I haven't I haven't gotten I haven't gotten the opportunity to thank you directly for uh, the significant bump that your 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 support has given us in numbers like uh, to an absurd degree. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm glad we we got in early with a really good ad. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Getting in early with a good ad is, is important. Oh man. So I got a, I got a, I got a question for you. So obviously, you know, we're, t- you uh, got season two coming out. Oh, what? I've got a frozen Travis on my screen. You got a frozen Travis. Oh no. Oh yeah. You, you still there, Travis? I assume he's just bracing himself for my question. He's, he's frozen mid salute. What's our troubleshoot here? We did not p- plan for this contingency. Ah, uh, presumably he'll... Oh, uh, how? My head. Oh, they're going to trade places. Here they go. Hey. I am the Travis now. <laughs> Yay. Welcome back. Ah. Uh-oh. Ooh, you're, you're, you're breaking up pretty bad. Okay, I think I'm back. Yes. I think the stream's okay, caught good. up with you. So, Next obviously, I'd be... Rem- 
I'd be remiss if uh, we didn't use this opportunity to talk to you about season two and the the uh, I guess elephant in the room, or should I say like brontosaurus or something in the room? Uh, so you're working with Jeff, Jeff Goldblum. Like that's got to be absolutely bonkers, right? Like how do you even deal with that? Absolutely, uh, it is is really fun. Jeff's a nice guy. Uh, it, it's it's like like working with the rest of the cast. Everyone's everyone's super friendly. We're all having a good time. Jeff was was really. I was surprised. Jeff was like, oh, hey, where's Caitlin? Where's Caitlin? Let's get Caitlin over here for a second. Is she, she in the room? Can you get her on the camera? It's like, I want to say hi to her, too. <laughs> it's like, what motivated you originally to, like, reach out together? Um, oh, did you miss that? So, in our, in, our, um, in our basement with our friends, there is a, a pillow with Jeff Goldblum's face on it. <laughs> maybe Perfect. I'm still here. Maybe not. And it's been with us for like our D and D campaigns for a long period of time. And I was like, I was playing D and D, and I was seeing the pillow, and I was like, Jeff Goldblum, D and D, Jeff Goldblum, D. You know what? I have an idea. Right. <laughs> it's like dress for the job you want. Like you put the the wheels in motion, and the like fate just took the took the rest of it. I guess. So Jeff well, he's always so fantastic. Oh, God, sorry. sorry, I was going to say is he's very fantastic, and um, I I wanted to. I never thought I could work with Jeff and the idea sort of crossed my mind in that moment. And then it was like, you know what, what if, mm-hmm. and then somehow life I was found told, a way. I was told a long time. <laughs> I was told a long time ago that like, if you don't ask, you'll never get anything. Um, like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was watching, it was literally like watching my friend's dad buy a television. And then he was just like, hey, uh, can I get some speakers with this? And they were like, yeah, sure, we can do that. And they just gave him like a $200 set of speakers for this like $2,000 uh, television. And then on the drive back, he was like, look, Zach, if you don't just ask people things, they're not going to do it. You know, if you, if you just, you just got to put yourself out there. You got to demand and the world will kind of try to find a way to give you what you want. Mm-hmm. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. But like, honestly, if, if I was Frank, I, Goldblum always seemed like the kind of person who is just super cool and extremely aloof and like, he wouldn't, it, like th- that warmth wouldn't be there. I mean, is he, is he, is he like an energetic person when he's, when he's playing or just in day-to-day life? The level, know? his level of energy is incredibly high. I, oh, yeah. um, it was, he was very, very attentive, very present. Uh, he was as appreciative to be in the room as with us as, as we were with him. It was very like, what? Like, that's what I was saying. Like he knew Caitlin, like, and and it's like, wow. Um, so so I, I think he was either aware of us from our work and the stuff we've done over the last five or six years in the the podcasting space or like something to that effect. Cause there was, there was definitely, this was not something that could have been done. Mm -hmm. I think other, I I feel otherwise, Mm -hmm. if he wasn't aware of what we're up to. Um, So it was it was really neat, and and he was definitely very energetic, very friendly, incredibly friendly and uh, witty. And we we often would get caught off topic on things, like even in his introduction, like he's introducing his character, and then all of a sudden there's chocolate pillaments in the discussion. I, I don't know how that got <laughs> in there. <laughs> it's like they always end up where you don't Jeff, expect okay. them. Those yeah, chocolate I, pillaments. I, I I feel that in my heart. Yeah, I love that. So you have a very awesome lovable and and well-known celebrity that you've gotten to work with if you could pick the next one who would it be <laughs> Ooh, that's that's tough um you know I, I hadn't gotten that far uh i guess my my thoughts were really just like f um and mm-hmm. i was like oh that, that yeah, that's awesome done in oh, one may, Je- Jeff maybe, occupies uh, every thought every waking moment <laughs> well, i'm not Honestly, uh, it was really, uh, it was, it was, I was only going to ask Jeff and like, that was like, that was my thought. I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes, it makes the most sense. Yeah. I, if I was going to ask anyone in the world who would want to play you with, it'd be Jeff. And then it was like, all right, Jeff. And it worked out. And I was like, Just, oh, well, I, I didn't have a second. I wasn't prepared for option two. <laughs> raising the bar for everyone else you work with in the future, for sure. <laughs> For me, I feel I like it so has to be Judy Judy Dench. Ever since uh, Vin Diesel mm. like broke that broke that seal, I feel like she's definitely got to be up for more D anD D. And if I could just slide in and just get her to play in something, that would be great. Honestly, yeah. though, Vin Diesel would be a pretty good luck addition, right? Wouldn't he be a, like a fantastic like extra on luck? Sure. I want to. I want to get. I don't know, yeah, like Tilda Swinton or someone. <laughs> okay. Well, fine. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> 
Um, so I want to ask you a question that might possibly alienate some of your fans. Uh, what for sure. you is your favorite addition of Dungeons and Dragons? And if not that game in particular, are there any other tabletop role playing games you find to be much? Really better? draw a line in the sand for us, please. <laughs> line in the sand, pretty easy for me. Uh, if I'm going to be playing a tactical battle game, I want to mm-hmm. play 4E because it's like it has the most fun oh. combat. And if you're looking to to fight stuff, and that's like your thing, and you're just like, you know what, we're gonna duke it out with some goblins and have some ridiculous, and we're all gonna be in together in a room, and there's gonna be models on the table. It's a fun addition for that. Absolutely. If you're gonna play like more than just a, a one shot, I, I I love five E. I think it's it's so it's like three three point five, but but better crafting and mm-hmm. and like it fewer rules than than Warhammer, and and fewer rules than most board games I played. Um, and, and also just so much room for creativity. And if you don't like something, you can just, you can homebrew it. Or if you, yeah. if you want something to be different, you can homebrew it. It's so a, I, I have a, a true love of 5e. They, they right. did a great job of creation by subtraction for sure with 5e. Yeah. Which is literally I do miss some of the extra pr- combat stuff. It's literally one of my favorite design principles. Design by subtraction means a lot to me. And the idea that they were willing to find ways to combine and trim and tweak really makes 5th edition my favorite D&D experience. That being said, though, like... I'm going to be completely honest, despite the fact that we've got a very long running series in D and I don't like D and D like, honestly, there are so many systems that do individual things better. And I tend to just go for those wherever possible. So my question to you is what's a non D and D system, or even, even more importantly, what is a, what is a not well known system that you absolutely love? This is where I go, well, I wrote this book called Liberty after, but no, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the real answer. answer. Um, I, I, I do enjoy that one, but it is it, it is largely D and D five E OGL stuff. Um, mm. So that it's it's pretty clear and cut. Uh, I, I enjoyed man. Um, sorry, it's been so long because I've I've largely focused on five E because I, I'm used to being the DM almost every time I have to be, and then like mm-hmm. when I'm not the DM, or, yeah, I am the DM usually because then I'm then like I have to introduce new players to playing the game. That that's basically been my job for the last twenty plus years. Mm-hmm. And that's it's such an easy game. Uh, but the the backup for me, uh, da, 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 uh, Vampire VTM Second Ed is a lot of fun uh, when you're oh, playing yeah. with the right people. Um, oh, yes. And then an Hero uh, with most games, <laughs> making yeah, sure you're yeah. with the right people. I mean, don't get yes. me wrong. I definitely play Vampire the Masquerade alone too. But <laughs> sure. Ah, I've got my FU FU to a guy named Kyle, who I, I played D and D with a long time ago, and and Vampire the Masquerade with, and he would always try and kill my characters just because he didn't like me. It's very annoying. What I tried to kill his dick. too, but hey, fuck I, you, as Kyle. Kid. Yeah, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, hot bag of diapers, you piece of shit. From high school. <laughs> <laughs> we know so you're my, watching. My one. <laughs> I love it. Um, my I will. I, sheets. I have to make my my uh, every single episode recommendation for Song of Ice and Fire made by Green Ronin. Uh, if you have it's a chance, required check it at out. This point. <laughs> it's ult- It's extremely good. Very low fantasy. Very good stuff. Absolutely love it. If you haven't tried it, try it out. And if you want good tactical combat, that's your boy. One of my favorite game mechanics in any system, which is uncomparable, is known as a charity party. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> A new segment. That's an old segment char- in a new format called the Charity Party. So we we are all creative storytellers. Um, that is something that we we do. Uh, we're D and D nerds. So what's going to happen in the Charity Party is as a uh, topic which which we can riff on and create some ideas from. I'm going to roll some percentage dice, uh, and we're going to get them twice. And there's a list I have. One of which is on 100 conversation starters for a party. And the other one is 100 adventure prompts for D&D. And we're going to mix them up in a cup and see what ideas come to mind as we as we play with them. And it's always a fucking travesty. It's a chart tide in here. So we've got an 11. We've got a travesty here, so it's perfect actually, for a travesty. That's actually a 1. I did, in fact, just roll a 1. And a 26. Okay. So. I can see your little half a screen there too. It's perfect. Oh yeah, I did totally leave the dice roller on. Perfect. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be a stream for us if we didn't leave something no, on the absolutely on the not. stream. So let's see what we got here. Uh huh. Oh okay. Do Jeopardy theme. So. 
Okay, so a god's weapon has fallen to earth, and now there is a race to obtain it. And have you ever been pulled over by the police? <laughs> so let's let's create a scenario in our heads where these two things are connected. Perhaps some great weapon of the gods falls to the mortal plane and begins doling out justice according to the edicts of that God by arresting people, pulling them over, throwing them into some kind of, uh, some kind of lawful sub dimension. I see. I was imagining <laughs> like the various municipalities are, are, are like trying to prevent adventurers from getting to this sword that's fallen from the sky. And so like, they just keep sending out their town guards to arrest them for any reason they can possibly find. And so it's just like, it's just this horrible process of being stymied by every action you take jaywalking, get the fuck in the dungeon. <laughs> yeah, I was or, going that direction too, but with like goblins with like the little flashy things from men in black, like, <laughs> <laughs> sure, there you go. <laughs> That's terrifying. Why would you give those to goblins? <laughs> it's god weapons. That's that's part of the, the effect of the... Everybody in the Tri-County area can't remember what their fucking name is. And goblins are somehow the king? And like up in fucking Cloud City, Hephaestus is like, Oh no, I dropped it. Where did it go? <laughs> and these it's, goblins the, uh, like, it's the rod of forgetfulness. Can I just say a flawless Hephaestus, by the way? Oh yeah, that's what he sounds like. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Also, like, that imagine running an adventure where the group has found the god weapon and they have to transport it, like, via wagon from one end of the country to the other. And every single organization on the way is trying to arrest them and pull them over to get their hands on it. It's a very much a repeated, these aren't the droids you're looking for scenario. I love it. Wonderful. Wonderful. That, uh, that, yeah. No, please, more thoughts. There's a there's a movie where they're they're driving uh, beer from one part of the country to the other. Uh, I forget the name of the movie, but like that's the entire plot of the movie right there. <laughs> it doesn't go any further. I'm picturing that with your prohibition like, era. <laughs> no, it was like 1960. It's, it's illegal to go from one state to another state with beer in that time, I guess. Um, and that was like his thing. He's like, I can I can get it in the truck and I'll get it from one country. I'll get it to your county because you need Coors Light or Coors or something. But it's like instead it's with this god weapon. Like we gotta get this this god weapon to the goblins. Yes. Those, those I goblins can't on have the a wedding without my natty light. This <laughs> giant <laughs> warhammer full of beer. Dude, can I just say how much I fucking love that Natty has been ripping on themselves lately? I've been seeing like Reddit ads for them being like, yeah, we know we're bad, but hey, we made something else awful that you can rip on too. And I'm like, fucking sick, <laughs> Natty. Way to be the bro. Way to read the room. <laughs> Excellent. Everybody wants to be a meme nowadays. God. Everybody wants to be a meme. Uh, so what kind of things should people know about your let's let's stick with dark dice for now um sure if, to to get them what's the bait on the hook what's going to pull them in to get them to start listening and catching up for the horror stay for the hurdy gurdy <laughs> <laughs> no but for for real um uh we besides jeff goblin being a uh one of the actors on the show if that doesn't hook you i, I don't know what will but um Go we're on. we're basically we're a uh, we're, we're not for all ages. It's a very scary podcast. It's it's very in character. We do roll dice, and the dice sometimes kill off characters who get me into trouble for killing off their characters, and I I don't get to see them for a long time because they're not playing them a game anymore. Uh, but it's it's, uh, it's fun. It's spooky, and, and and above all, we we've got these really wonderfully human moments, and and the soundtrack's pretty good too. Sound what about season great. two in particular stands out? Like what's something, what's something about season two that you're, uh, other than ob the obvious. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. It's, it's not as railroady. You're going to get to finally see the world that I've been working on since I was like six years old. And some of the six year old ideas are still there. And they're, they're like, uh, he says, Oh, it, desert elves, they can't get sand in their eye. And I'm like, I'm going to be like, okay, well, let's take this in a, in a physical direction. Like not just like a, a, a like children, like, Oh, they're so cool. They can't get sand in their eyes. Cause they live in a desert. Like, no, no, let's, let's make their eyes different. Sand, and actually, your sandals have nictitating membranes. I was going to cool. say, do they have <laughs> ocular membranes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh. That was a good idea. Six year old me. Why didn't I write? Oh, I did write that down. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I do occasionally go back and thank a very young middle school law for coming up with something really dumb at the time. And now it's pretty okay. I never had yeah. a single good idea before the age of 16. So uh, I don't know what you guys are talking about. See, 16 is when I really started locking in on the bad ideas. That's ah, the worst think. choices yeah. were made for me personally. None of them tabletop related. <laughs> that stayed it's, pretty it's, average. Uh, it's, it's a thing. And, and like, yeah, I, I, 
I think the 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 silly worldness and the weirdness is is a lot of fun to experience a, a wider world where um, you get the idea that it's scary because you know there are dragons out there and, mm-hmm. and in this world dragons kill people not the other way around typically um, so it's like if humanity is not the apex predator and there are spooky things in the woods kind of everywhere like what's that like and, and how mm-hmm. are people surviving and what's what's that sort of creepiness going to be like and of course there's uh the cast is a bunch of comedians it's jeff and, and uh um sean howard from end of time and other bothers and russ from uh, uh dungeons and dragons and peter lewis always can become funny on a dime yeah a degree Honestly, of humor I, I is so important you can't have pure pure horror without at least some moments of comedy. There's got to be some levity to give you context. You know, you need contrast to be like, okay, I know that these are people and not just a constantly stressful experience. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a roller coaster that just goes up. <laughs> and, then, and then you even, the even Dark Souls knows that they're like, oh, give <laughs> praise the sun. Yeah, tension release cycles are so important, and I feel like it's something that often gets missed in good horror storytelling. You know, mm-hmm. you got to find ways to let off the tension. <laughs> well, based on the period of time we have Absolutely. on my little recording meter here, I think now is actually a really good time to answer some questions from the chat. Um, so if you all take turns and don't flood us too much, we would love to pass your questions on to Travis and mm-hmm. fill some void with that. So what do you, what do you got for us? What do you want to ask? Don't ask if he's in his stepmom's closet because he's not. He's not in a closet. Totally not. Uh, Those hangers are just living room hangers. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's a decorative choice. Completely. (laughs) It's also a great way to test the chat delay. I feel like nobody (laughs) laughed at my Achartai joke and I'm very disappointed. I didn't even hear it. (laughs) I didn't get to hear it either. I had that like delay thing. There you go. That's fair. (laughs) An easy excuse. the Gol- delay thing that was wow. real. Golgrim has cheered Jesus. a thousand bits for us, letting you know that they love your music. <laughs> Holy so, crap. Thank you, thank you, Golgrim, and your message has been delivered. I will do, honestly, so when we did your spot on Luck, and we, I would like you gave us the music that you wanted us to use, I put it up and I was like, okay, I'm going to listen to that again, mm-hmm. and I'm going to listen to that again. And <laughs> <laughs> that was such a fun piece to make. Um, cause yeah. we had the, the lyrics in Icelandic, um, and I think a little bit of Infernal on that one, um, but mostly Icelandic. And then, yeah, we got a lot more coming. One of our mods and longtime fans of both LUQ and Fool and Scholar, Izzy Boshi is asking. Thank you for giving them to us. Yeah. Uh, what is the wildest <laughs> history nerd fantasy that you've ever had a chance to live out? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, outside of playing D&D with Jeff Goldblum. Let's, let's go with a different one. Um, <laughs> ooh, this is, this is tough. All history scholars uh, strive to hang out with Jeff. Right. That right. was, it was, it was, uh, what, just strictly nerd. There wasn't like a, a prefix history to it. History nerd. History nerd. Okay. Yes. History nerd. Um, history nerd dream. Uh, I got to ride a camel at the, uh, the, the pyramids in front of Egypt, uh, when I was, 12 years old. Wow. Um, and then we had like dinner at this really nice restaurant that got like blown up the next month. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, so that was, it was like the ultimate experience. I got to eat at the place I wanted to eat. I got to like see the pyramids. Um, and there were some really uh, cool things around there at the time. I got to see the Sphinx, uh, which actually is not as close to the pyramids as you would think. Um, right. And then like, we had a really great time because, like, that month in 1999, like, nothing bad happened in Israel or, or Jordan or Egypt. And we just did, like, this little trip there and, like, got mm-hmm. to hit all three. And, like, I And the Petra, restaurant that eventually blew <laughs> The restaurant. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, and then literally, like, next month, everything kind of went back to being, like, very tense. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was pretty a fun experience for me. Egypt um, took a break was, on the tension just for, so that you could visit that restaurant. <laughs> right. Yeah. Egypt and, and like... As we're going by, there was like there was actually a place where we walked. We're like, oh, that's where the tourists were shot last year. We're like, oh, mm, cool. if, I could, if I could live out any history fantasy, I would want to either live like a Bedouin or shoot Franz Ferdinand, one or the other. Uh. <laughs> Someone was going to do it. I just want to cook in one of the old medieval kitchens that has like two spices and a hot rock that you have to put the pot on. Everything is salted to death, and everything will make you sick, but you just got to make it taste good anyway. Law, well, you need to go to Japan. They have an entire they have they have two different museums that are dedicated to uh, like 
pre-industrial revolution farm life in Japan. And so you got like these houses with like their living room kitchens and they're like all fully established and they all work. They're all functional. No, you're, but you're talking about like what is good and cultural food. I'm talking about like a shitty pigeon pie (laughs) cooked under an upside down cauldron. Got it. Okay, perfect. If I could see any event in history, though, I'd go back in time. There was this really amazing uh, war that was never fought because one army destroyed itself before the war. Um, I, I forget what this blunder was called, but like more than 80,000 people died because one army, uh, they got into a fight with um, a hooker and uh, two men shot at each other. They're in the same army, but they thought because it was like really dark that it was the other army shooting at them. And then different units in this gigantic army continued the fight. It, it actually was like an epic fails of history and, and, and badass of the week mm-hmm. both featured it. Was this somewhere in the Balkans? I just have to ask. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think that was exactly. And, and like, if I had to just guess, <laughs> when the when the enemy army arrived the next morning and saw the carnage, their response was, "Holy f! Something went down here," and they left because <laughs> they Fair. it's like so much death. Dragons. What, what took them out? <laughs> I'm I'm scrolling through for some questions here. One of the only ones I'm seeing is uh, Dana asks, "Are you listening to Battle Axis?" <laughs> I need more time to listen. I've been up from like 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Yeah, every we're, day. We're, we, have, we have diehard listeners who haven't listened a little yet. Like uh, uh, Dave Mlodinoff, who's been one of our staunch supporters and uh, like a huge helper in like some of the establishing stuff for uh, Battle Axis. He, he didn't even listen until like last week. And so like right. I don't. <laughs> we have one person whose name I'm guessing they just created, which is please I just have one cue. <laughs> asks what what happens if Jeff gets killed off quickly, and if that's something oh. you can't discuss, that's okay. But that is what. Oh, it's, it's totally fair. I mean, the show continues on without his character because he's dead. Nice. All there right. You go. That, that's commitment. That's I, commitment right I, there. You kill wife's character. You can't get much worse than that. I did not <laughs> ask. To, I did not ask to stop for death, or it stopped for me, and Jeff included. What's Very that from? Good. That sounds really good. I don't remember. It does sound good. I just, it's like I'm channeling dead crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> we can't start quoting Venture Brothers right now. Um, so that's actually a good question. Like, how do you deal with deaths on a podcast? Like, Law ultimately had to deal with the fact that we were all, like, hard-hitting superpower badasses. And also that he had an hour to work with, so he really couldn't afford to kill any of us. But I keep thinking about, like, so one of the big things I'm doing with Battle Axis is I'm including a wound system so that people can die easier. And, like, I'm trying to make it so that, like, you can't really resurrect without having glory to spend. So there's, like, a lot of stuff going on there. And I just keep thinking about, like, I know what I want to do if one of them dies. But what if they die again <laughs> what if what if they die a few times mm-hmm. and like do i find new cast do i let them roll a new character like and in a podcast versus just a normal D game what's the protocol oh yeah the, the the podcast world for me is just like you're dead you're dead you're off the show sorry goodbye i will uh wish you well the only the exception is of, of course horror. one person yeah, it's like less people. I don't have to deal with less of you. I can do, I can get more detailed in your backstory, and we can we can work on that stuff. And your so, if you survive make, the campaign, we can maybe <laughs> you make a character on your show. Like just take all of the armor class and hit point feats. So you have the biggest chance of survival. It, it's funny. Like the 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 goal for a lot of the players players is not to survive. Like they're not planning to die, but their their goal is to play true to their character, even if that means death. So, honestly, honestly, going into a horror game, I feel like you kind of know that. Go ahead, Law. Yeah. Oh, no. I would say, slightly like, different mentality. <laughs> going into it, if I knew that it was like a fucking cool death, I wouldn't be bummed about it in the slightest. I'd be like, fuck yes. Like our I first think, season, we lost people to really cool deaths. I, yeah. And we made like a huge funeral out of it. And like people apparently cried when they're listening. I keep getting that note like, you made me cry at work. <laughs> it's like, One sorry. of my favorite uh, Session Zero questions is, how should your character die? Because it's such a powerful use of, of, of like, like a person's like arc, you know, and, mm. and it gives us a powerful stop. And that way, honestly, I think it puts in their head to constantly be thinking about how that's going to happen. And so mm. they might look for opportunities to make it happen. Otherwise, you know, I think every, every character's instinct is to preserve their own life. But if you get the idea of mortality into their head right off the bat, I think you have a much greater chance of having meaningful deaths that don't just feel like somebody rolled a bad die. Right. Oh yeah, and uh, I, I would say 
um, the unfortunate side effect is I'm a hardcore dice person. So if you die by the dice, I'm just like, ooh, I'm so sorry. I've, I've done my job too well. Yeah. And we were really close to like total party kills two or three times in the campaign that I didn't, I was unaware of because I wasn't monitoring their HP. I'm like, you know, we were within one HP, right? I'm like, oh, wow, that could have been a very different ending or <laughs> end of the show right there. <laughs> I do love the old uh, dying on just like scraps of health scenario where the whole party is just like on their last legs. Um, we do have a question from the Golden Stylus, which is what are some of your favorite resources for making maps? Hmm. Maps. Um, you know, uh, I, I actually should. There, there's one. Ooh, Ink Carnate is yeah. a pretty one. I unfortunately don't use it as much as I should because um, I have a friend who can draw maps pretty well and, and she nice. helps me. Um, we have one too. Uh, They're or, called yeah. Golden Stylus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for like battle maps, I actually uh, I, I draw them so poorly that the players make fun of me. Um, if I bother drawing them at all, um, it, it became a huge point of conversation in Liberty Vigilance where they would just make fun of my maps. So I, I gave up and just like, theater of the mind, I'm going to describe it very well. And you'll just, anywhere you want to kind of be, just tell me where you are in the room and we'll go from there. It's was honestly been a habit of me. No, oh, good. No. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say when Incarnate first came out, it was very exciting. I thought it was a really well done thing. And then for like a solid year, Every fantasy map I saw online, I was just like, they made that and incarnate. It has like such a distinct style, which I have no problem with because honestly, they look great, but they're just so obviously made in incarnate that I kept seeing them over and over. I don't know what if that like pushed me away or pulled me in, but I was just like, uh, this is their year, man. Honestly, like damning luck is one of the first times I've ever decided to actually do battle maps and minis. Like I've always been theater of the mind and I felt like I honestly almost felt like doing a podcast meant that I had to do a theater of the mind. Like if I tried to do maps that have become too mired in the, the specifics and the technicalities of like motion and whatnot. But honestly, I I'm, I'm kind of coming around to it. And I feel like since we've got a genre that's very like sport heavy, I feel like there's this kind of assumption that there's going to be a level of mm -hmm. tactical like processing going on there. And if I did theater of the mind, I feel like I'd be kind of robbing the fans of that opportunity to feel like, okay, this is a sport. There's yeah. rules to this experience. Yeah, when when I, we decided I was going to DM season that. one, I, I, I was so obsessed with miniatures that I just had to bring them and and kind of start that trend of like every game there's big props, there's a printed map, there's miniatures at the table. That's just how I DM. So if I was going to do it, that was my comfort zone. I have a bag of if, ice. By the way, <laughs> I thought you it's said dice cool. for a second. It's a very nice bag. It's it's a cylindrical bag for those listening of of ice. Apparently, mm -hmm. it, it looks mm -hmm. rather cool. If any of my players were in the same time zones or even the same continents, I would do that stuff. But I never actually get to meet with people. It's always through Zoom, and there's like a half second or quarter second delay. And when I'm talking to them, so I can't do so many visual things like logistically, which is unfortunate. Ooh, it's that's also a good usually question. two a.m. Izzy Bosi also just asked, "What are your favorite parts of your post process?" And also, can I throw in a side note? Uh, what could one do to be a better post processor? Uh, totally unselfishly, <laughs> I ask this question. <laughs> EQ, everything, and then the other thing is uh, cut out any redundant information that you feel is not fun. Uh, you guys do that very well, I think. Um, like well, we're, uh, redundant. Sam <laughs> Sam Hediger has been doing a great job of of cutting out redundant information because uh, he's been editing for us for the last like forty episodes. Uh, and he's been doing an amazing job of it. Um, and that's that's honestly, sometimes though, I do have to be like, hey, Sam, we don't need that info. <laughs> because I think yeah. his inclination, because he, he studies like online pedagogy and like information uh, exchange and stuff like that. He's a teacher. And I think his instinct is to go, we need to teach everybody how to play D&D. &D, so if this information hasn't been said before, we need to include it. And I'm like, I think we can assume this isn't people's first D&D podcast. I think right. we can skip that data. <laughs> and he's also a genuine fan of the show. So the idea of mm. like anything being on the cutting room floor can sometimes like make people feel sad but it's just so necessary like the thing is covered yeah. it's confetti it's a, it's a slaughterhouse that cutting room we, floor his name is uh sam hediger and we call him hediger the editor <laughs> which i think is appropriate that is that's a fantastic nickname um i i think the only piece of info that we left for like dnd rules was like jeff explaining how to how to tell if something's poison or like how to tell what a potion is because it was just like that was genius i was like that is the best explanation we're keeping that that's gold yeah, okay. it's like so you see with a, with a potion <laughs> it's like wow <laughs> it's just this monologue like it was it was beautiful oh, uh, but to answer the note. oh god uh, sorry go hmm? no i, I no, forgot what the original question was <laughs> let's hear the side note and then i guess we'll get to it answer your question 
a uh, favorite part of the post process is like sound effects are in and the music is in or when the music's in when the music drops and I've got like the sound effects and it actually sounds like I need it to sound because like before that it sounds super nerdy when you have like all right I'm gonna hit the thing and then you're like ha, ha, he, ha, ha. And there's like nothing backing it I, I just asked for like give me five takes of you hitting the thing and then they record it and they send it to me and then like I have like the reaction I'm like ah I've been hit that's usually me or like a monster like in the background you know something like that that's been a hard stuff that was a hard thing for us when we started we asked ourselves do we want to include music do we want to include sound effects and i think the in the end we were like okay do we want to do we want to put that kind of work in and honestly like we put a lot of work in as it is and i feel like our episodes take so much time and i think if we had added that i think if we had done something like added fully or or added to music as, as a backing uh, I would have drive, driven us insane. I don't think we would have made it 112 episodes. What we're saying is we have not, a ton of respect for the do. process. <laughs> the, it is involved in, in fine-tuning that many tracks to that level of quality. Also, just who I, I am as a person, I don't feel like I have the patience for it. <laughs> there were 76 tracks in this episode um, with a lot of condensing because I tried really hard to condense multiple sound effects types together just so it would be fewer tracks. I was we, like in the hundreds. We kind of get to dip our toes into both pool because of the meta. So we can like do it, all the music and sound editing we want for the story bits. But when it comes to the gameplay, it's just, just folks tacking. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything you would like to say to the people listening before we wrap up this episode of D20 questions? Um, if, if for some reason you haven't listened to this show, it's, it's. What a perfect time for interesting. us. It's called League of Ultimate Questing. Oh. <laughs> You're promoting our shit. There was oh, a no. short, if, if you, was a short if you, cutout. You've also listened to League of Ultimate Questing, then I would recommend this other show called Dark Dice. It's pretty okay. So I, I have one last final question. How do you not feel awkward saying the name of our stupid podcast? It's fantastic. It's it's fan flipping tastic. I love it. It's, it's like such seriously, a chintzy name. Like we we like I I genuinely believe that the reason why I pushed it so hard for law is because I wanted to be able to say we wish you luck as the sign off, and that was it. Like it's one of those just awkward situations where like you had an idea and that had to be the thing, and now looking back on it, I'm like I should have gone with any other name, man. No, I was any always other. in favor of League of Ultimate Quest. I think it's perfect. You're like you know a wrestling announcer. League of Ultimate Quest. <laughs> <laughs> like the echo and you the- know exactly what you're getting it's it's just right yes. just such schlock <laughs> it's beautiful schlock uh, well uh that's, that's the secret right there <laughs> you heard it here from travis please please do listen to dark dice it is a very very beautifully done show and it's emotional and musical and spooky and refined and it's it, it will inspire you for any future project i'm certain Thank you. Well, I mean, honestly, this has been D20 Questions, uh, a long time coming. We've even got, like, backlog that we're going to try and re-edit and put out. Because, honestly, we've got, like, four episodes we just kind of abandoned when COVID hit. But I swear to God it'll come. Uh, This one, hopefully, we'll see the light of day before those, even though I feel really bad about pushing back uh, uh, Patch's D21 sides release. (laughs) Um, we're going to be closing this down and we're going to keep talking to Travis mm-hmm. for our one sides. If you want to see our one sides, go ahead and just donate to our Patreon. Uh, if you do that, you get a whole extra episode of all of our D20 questions. If you liked this, uh, you should find D20 questions on basically everywhere where you can find podcasts because mm-hmm. honestly, it's everywhere. Uh, and it has not gotten the love that luck has gotten. So I would love to see more of that. And then we're going to do, the, as you said, D21 side, which is more of this with more of this. So <laughs> Yes, it's, it's more drinking. And I would also say that we kind of like, we just it, we take off the gloves and it becomes more relaxed. Thank you, Golkarim. Jesus. I was going to get slapped in the face with the glove. Thank you so much, Golkarim. But seriously, get on that Patreon. That's the only way we can offer them. That's where we put them on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We're going to try and do this as a stream more often. And so, you know, you'll be seeing us throw these out periodically. We're going to be sharing it on social media, et cetera. But I'd say thank you guys again for joining us on D20 Questions. And join us next time when we release our brand new fighter subclass, the Pog Champion. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>